And this is where we switch over to the Amari Cooper conversation because holy fuck. In the aftermath of that game, I had no doubt. Like, you're a two and four football team. You're the New York Jets. You're two and four. Yet you get more run and you get more press. And also, as everybody knows, they created a, a they created a, a Super Bowl window for themselves. The second that they divested of all this stuff in order to get Aaron Rodgers. So the idea that they were going to trade for Devontae Adams didn't seem crazy, did it? They, no. were, they were one of the only teams in the NFL that had the ability to make the money work. Yeah. yeah. You know, like every Bills fans going, oh, the Bills are calling. They need to get it done. Why? Why do you have to get it done for an older wide receiver who you don't know will match your quarterback? And also the money that he's owed is crazy. There's no way to make it work with our current books. It's a non-starter. But sure, let's scream about it. Can I scream about DK Metcalf? Oh, my God. <laughs> you you saw those messages? <laughs> yeah, yeah, with Greg from some, cover some, one. Some idiot tweets out, well, if we don't go after DK Metcalf, then our, our Brandon Bean's not serious about making this a better team. And all Greg could respond with, because as nice as he's trying to be, is DK Metcalf's cap number for this year is like 20-something million dollars. <laughs> That's not a movable object. You people, this is the WGR callers. And this is why I give guys like Greg and t- t- the people got like Mario and Paul over at hashtag and all of the guys who go out of their way to interact with their fans on that level. Like, hey, I want to teach you some things. God bless you. Because people who are morons, I have no time for. When I hear a caller who clearly doesn't understand the NFL salary cap, but still feels entitled to yell about a hot take or an opinion about what the what the bill should do. I can't listen to it. I'll bite a whole out. Chris, I'll bite my steering wheel. Yeah. With these fucking shark fangs. So understandably, the bills needed an upgrade in talent. And I think last night's win probably cemented it in Brandon Bean's mind. Hey, we're two and a half games up in our division. It, and now our schedule gets easy. Chris, if we had lost the game last night, I don't know that they don't make this trade, but also it gives him less incentive to do it. You make this trade because you believe in this year. At the start of this season, it seemed like a rebuilding project, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Retooling is what they call it. Sure. That's a fancy that, that, that that's the white collar way to say we're rebuilding because you don't want to offend anybody. But now that you're four and two and you have a two and a half game lead in your division with a softening schedule, you all of a sudden believe that, hey, wait a minute. If I just add a few things, maybe I can actually make make some run here. This doesn't have to be just a lost year. And I think that that win went a long way towards cementing it in Brandon Bean's mind that, hey, tomorrow morning, I got to make that call. Yeah, we got Tennessee, Seattle, Miami and Indianapolis as our next four. So you could. Buffalo could easily go uh, on a 5-0 run here, including last night's win. It's crazy to see what's in front of us now. And so you bring in Amari Cooper. Roll Tide! Woo! Chris, I'm going to be the most obnoxious. Do you know how much I love it when an Alabama player makes their way to the Buffalo Bills roster? Yeah, I remember Reggie Ragland. Yeah, and here's the problem. Every Alabama player we've taken, it either goes well for a little while and then blows up or just craters on impact. Reggie Ragland. Marcel Darius. Well, Marcel Darius was great right up until he decided that he'd made enough money and started smoking the ganj on a boat. Yeah, Cyrus Quanjo. Cyrus Quanjo, just naked in the field. Yep. Jesus Christ. Do you know that that's the most memorable thing he ever did as a Buffalo Bill? Yeah. I believe it. So in that way, I'm pumped that a, an Alabama alumni is going to join the Buffalo Bills. Here's what I think about in the aftermath of the first of all, Chris, what was your first reaction? I want to hear it. When you realized that, like, hey, when I te- when I texted you just one thing, Amari Cooper. I assume that we got him in a trade. I don't know because football is so uh, the t- the timing and the verbiage that you have to learn within a playbook. I don't think that we're going to see 
a return on investment for like two or three weeks. I'm not sure Amari's going to come in, hit the ground. I don't even if he does he pl- even play on Sunday. We don't know. I mean, he's going to be here for the whole install week, but maybe against maybe he'll play against Seattle for sure. But the chemistry he's got to get down with Josh, the timing with all the routes, learning all the verbiage. I think it might be two to three weeks before we see a real step with the the chemistry between Josh and Amari. I don't know that he's going to come in first game, nine targets, 125 and a tutty. I don't foresee that happening. What I believe you need is some time. There's going to be install time, but that's okay. Because who do we have up next? The Tennessee Titans. Great. Seattle, Miami, <clears throat> Indy. You're talking about a group of opponents who aren't, you know, like you look at Seattle and you say, well, they, they've got a great record. And then you go, but they did lose to the Giants. <laughs> they lost to the Giants. You go, okay, maybe that's a team we can get. And then you look at Miami and go, I don't know if you're talented enough because you just got into a rock fight with the Patriots. You had your bye week. You're hoping to get Tua back, but also what does that do for you? You were still like you weren't hitting the ground running week one when you had him. No. So what is this now? What does this look like that he's coming back post-concussion? Is he actually ready? They've got more questions than they have answers. Plus, they've lost a number of key contributors to injury. Javon Holland broke a bone in his hand. Jordan Poyer's been banged up. They lost Jalen Phillips for the year. Into his absence, this thing, this unraveling of a roster has continued. You're looking at the, the Indianapolis Colts. It's Joe Flacco, right? It's Joe Flacco and Taylor, and like there's nothing dynamic or surprising about them. They're not a special team. They just are sound. Mid, as they, the they, kids they, say. They're a middling team that if you – sure, if you dick around with them, you can lose to them. If you do your job, you play assignments on football, you're in that game for four quarters. So what you did was you opened a window and now you bring in Amari Cooper. And when I look at this, the first thing I think is, you know, I, I was in, I was literally in a Twitter spaces today when it happened. I've started doing this now when I work from home, if I'm sitting there and I'm working on spreadsheets and stuff, I'll jump into a Twitter space. Today, it was a Jets space. For an hour, I listened to Jets fans just scream and talk about driving their car off the road on their morning commute. It was awesome. And then I switched over to a Bills one. And while I was in it, and we were literally talking about the shortcomings of the Bills offense, the the trade news broke. And I'll never forget this. A guy named Whittle, who I'm going on his podcast tomorrow night to talk about this, said, yo, I need someone to get me that, that meme template from The Wire where it's Idris Elba going, I want you to tell everybody we're back up. And instead he goes, I want you to tell everybody we twist in dicks. (laughs) <laughs> we twisted dicks in here. We're the Buffalo Bills. We just got Amari Cooper. We're twisting dicks. And realistically, that's what this is. You just gave Josh Allen something he hasn't had in six weeks, which is a, a receiver who's a veteran, who's savvy, who is otherworldly talented in terms of instincts. And then you look at what we're the guys were pushing down the totem pole for him, Chris. Is it a shock to you that MVS was the guy who got the axe? <laughs> I, oh, I didn't even know that. I didn't even yeah, see that somebody see? got cut. So I said it in the spaces. They were like, well, who takes a backseat to Amari Cooper? I go, dude, Samuel and MVS play no special teams. None whatsoever. So both of them can ride pine. At the same time, Samuel, last night when he caught that deep ball, he tried to run away. He tried to run away to the middle field. And if this was Khalil Shakir that had caught that deep ball that, that Samuel caught, he probably, with no safety up over the top, he probably makes it to the center of the field and runs the thing in for a touchdown. Samuel made it seven, maybe eight feet before defenders who were completely flat-footed caught up with him. Now, I don't know if it's his age. I don't know if it's the toe issue, but whatever it is, his explosiveness, his speed, it's gone. 
he can't contribute to this offense anymore. And so I almost feel like that also played a role in them executing this trade. But MVS getting released, Chris, who gives a shit? Who cares? Do you miss MVS? No, I didn't even know he was here. Do you know that? Well, exactly. <laughs> what did you do? What is it? Like if they called him in, like it was a meeting with the Bobs, they were like, what is it you say you do here? And he goes, well, I run that nine route. Cool. I ran a post once and Josh tried to throw it to me and I dropped it. <laughs> They're like, yeah, give me your playbook. <laughs> get, 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 get out of here. Just, just go. Now, this is what I like. The Amari Cooper signing gives them enough competent pass catchers. And the fact that Tyrell Shavers didn't look like a slouch, is this finally time to put, maybe you can make Curtis Samuel a game day inactive? Possible. In a game like this against the Titans, where you're going to try to run the ball, you're not going to throw it a ton. Their pass defense, despite LeJarrius Sneed being a slouch, is a slob. Maybe you, to a, a part of me almost wants to put him on the IR. And just let him get healthy. But now you don't have to worry about who's going to supply skill to our wide receiver core. Trust me, there's a guy. We've got a guy for that, Curtis. You can go sit down. I love the fact that he's number two and now the conversation is starting. How does he get the number from Tyler Bass? Somebody stepped in. They were like, oh, him taking, he's going to take number two when he gets here. Because that's been his number his entire NFL career. Do you know that the only way that you can change jerseys in season with active players is if one of them's cut? That I did not know. Chris, the Bills have the opportunity to do the funniest thing ever. <laughs> cut Tyler Bass for a jersey number? Uh, and when you think about the schematic advantages it gives us, or even just the trades of the day, since we're here talking about Jets bills, as we kind of wrap this conversation up, for the Jets, does this trade for Devontae Adams fix their problems? No. Chris, every time their quarterback was pressured last night, it turned into a sack or a hurry or a quarterback hit or some, some negative consequence for their quarterback. Meanwhile, their running game wasn't as robust. Like, it, it, they did well. Yeah. But one of the craziest things is, Chris, do you know how many light boxes? Or here's the thing. How, how many heavy boxes, eight-plus defenders, do you think Brees Hall saw last night? I have no idea. Zero. The Bills never once loaded the box. So when Brees Hall puts up season best running yards it's because we didn't even try to stop it we just said hey we know aaron Rodgers is going to be the reason you win this game fuck you come get us let Brees hall run the ball and then in a play that you know taylor rapp who i would say deserves some flowers because danger you know danger you know fire close <laughs> danger close taylor rapp he showed you what the upside of that dangerous play style is when he's on. And then just his athleticism, like he came from across the other side of the field, Chris, to cut off Brees Hall and stop his touchdown run. Did you see that play? No, I didn't. I was on my way to work. Brees Hall's breaking down the left sideline to what looks like a sure touchdown. Rap comes from the other hash to cut him off at like the 10, and it's a drive where they end up kicking a field goal. That are only second half points. So in this way, it's one of those things where the Jets have more problems. <laughs> they have more problems than just one wide receiver. It doesn't absolve them. It doesn't fix their offensive line or the tackles who are getting beat up by AJ Epinesa. It doesn't fix the other players who aren't carrying their weight. It doesn't care. It doesn't fix your run defense. It just gives Aaron Rodgers another guy in the building he can play golf with and talk shit about the head coach about. Meanwhile, for the Bills, how many of our problems does our trade solve? <sighs> Man, think about it. Schematically, he's not a burner. You know, it's uh, yards per pass on uh, Twitter. 
did a deep dive into his film and had some really nice insights. Guys, go check it out on Twitter, yards per pass. But basically said after looking at his games, the deep ball thing isn't there anymore. Like he's not streaking down the field, burning people, whatever. At the same time, like he, the, the point, everyone who's a detractor of this trade goes, well, we could have had that guy, but instead we got Cooper and he's in the PFF doghouse. He's got the highest drop rate, whatever. He's rated 100 out of 100 receivers. He had 1,200 yards last season, Chris. That doesn't just evaporate, does it? No, and he's get a better quarterback now. And like he came from a team that, in the off-season bootleg football podcast, Brett Coleman and EJ Snyder, two smart football people, right? Mm-hmm. They called the Browns offense a Ferrari with square wheels. <laughs> He's going from that to the Buffalo Bills, who are churning out 20, 30-point games with nothing. They've been over here making water into wine on offense for weeks. And it's been ugly and it's been tough and they've been trying to figure it out. He was a target monster when he had 1,200 yards. I don't expect him to be that guy. He's not. And anybody expecting Stefan Diggs in his prime, you're not getting that. What you're getting, though, is a big physical wide receiver who is the most nuanced route runner on the entire roster right now. The guy who, when he's manned up, understands how to run a tight route, get separation, make himself available and catch the ball when it's delivered to a catchable location. If he's half the player he was last season and he gets better quarterback delivery than he's gotten all year from just Deshaun Watson, who Chris, it's not a, it's not a secret that he's having one of the worst seasons for any quarterback in NFL history. Oh yeah. If he gets half of like half of that back, and he also gets a better quarterback performance, this guy has the chance to be an absolute juggernaut for the right team. And oh, by the way, he's a really good run blocker because he's big. He's built like a brick shit house. Chris, doesn't that fit right in with the narrative of all of our yeah. wide receivers? Yeah. I don't remember Diggs ever run blocking very well. No. And now, now the beauty of this is you have a legitimate boundary threat, a wide receiver who can play the Z so that you can take Keon Coleman and say, look, we're going to go let Mac Hollins play on the outside and we can move you to the slot sometimes. And then we can roll out an 11 personnel formation that has heavy, good run blocking wide receivers, and you can mash downhill in the running game if you want to. And at the same time, you can go and you can play the intermediate passing route game and know that every single wide receiver for you on the field. Oh, by the way, if you want to go, you know, four wide receiver set, Khalil Shakir, you, you've got a bunch of redwoods that everyone has to be worried about physicality in terms of beating their defensive backs. And then you put Shakir in the slot, and let him go to work. This team just got more options. At a time when I think, Chris, we were starting to get exposed for being limited, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Like the Ravens pretty much showed Houston, like, hey, look, Buffalo doesn't have shit if you don't give them shit. In that Houston game, Josh went, went nine for 30. It was awful. You can't have that. No. So then this week, they came in and said, fuck it, we'll run the offense through the running backs. And then make you make us stop. And then luckily their secondary, assisted with a lot of dog shit penalties, proved to be the thing that moved momentum towards the Buffalo Bills for all this. I just think that in the aftermath of this game, the win and the way we won kind of set the precedent for Breen that, hey, today I've got to make this call. 